Welcome everyone. I'm happy to see so many of you on a weekday night to come uh, to our annual Charles Michael Lecture, a collaboration between the Taubi Center for Jewish Studies and the Jewish Community Center here in San Francisco, a collaboration between the South Bay and the city. I'm Professor Charlotte Elisheva von Robert the current director of Jewish studies at Stanford. Um, and we are extremely grateful to Charles Michael to, uh, to enable this event, our seventh annual Charles Michael Lecture, which allows us to bring to the Bay Area top scholars and community leaders, cultural leaders who speak both in the city, up here in the north, and on campus at Stanford down south. Charles has been a great supporter of Jewish studies at Stanford. Aside from this lecture, the endowed chair held by my colleague, Professor Aaron Rodrigue, the Charles Michael uh, Professor in the Study of Jewish Culture and History. And before I introduce uh, tonight's speakers, I would like to give the podium to Charles Michael to welcome all of you and speak to us. Thank you, Charlotte. Appreciate it. I'd like to read to you a couple of brief articles and then tell you a little bit about my background. The German army honors Jews who fought in World War I. This is from the New York Times uh, in the year 2010. It says, German soldiers, including one wearing a yarmulke, uh, filed uh, silently through a leaf-covered cemetery in Frankfurt on Sunday to lay wreaths at the Jewish soldiers' memorial. The, the ceremony, first few public service at the, at the late, at the, I'm sorry, at the site, a long time to remember the, the organized effort of, of Jewish soldiers who fought bravely uh, for the, for the Kaiser in the world in World War One? More and and more young Jews are are are, are placing their trust in the army. Gideon Hillebra, uh, General Staff Officer in the Defense Ministry and uh, Deputy Chairman of, Ju of the Jewish Soldiers Committee. Historian uh, Egmont Zechin um, headed the celebration and uh, it was responsible for a, a subject report on the Deutsche Frankfurt, uh, the Deutsche Politik, and Jeden uh, Hersten Vertrag. He writes, the Jews were German to their core. Now, it is interesting that uh, my my background is. Uh, is German Jewish. My father served in the in World War One, and uh, got a prize uh, for an, an, an Iron Cross for bravery, and was relieved of service before the end of the war to supply tungsten to the German military for bullets. I'm delighted to be here again. And I wish you a very pleasant evening.
Thank you so much, Charles, and for making this possible. So you all realize that this to uh, tonight's topic is dear to Charles' heart and to many of us. Um, I'm honored now to introduce to you two of my colleagues, Professor Derek Penzler and Professor Stephen Zipperstein, both of them Jewish historians, scholars of Jewish history with international acclaim, delightful human beings with deep commitments to Jewish culture and Jewish scholarship, and friends, if one can say this, of senior colleagues. I'm happy to be a scholar of Jewish studies because of colleagues like them. <laughs> um, they'll discuss tonight the role of Jews in World War I, now that we are in the midst of a four-year, hundredth anniversary of the Great War of 1914 to 1918. And actually, all over Europe, a great rethinking and memorializing has started in the last couple of years, and I'm sure we may hear of this tonight. Our guest of honor tonight from abroad is Professor Derek Penzler. He comes to us from, from Oxford, where he has been teaching since 2012. He has taught at many institutions in the United States, in Canada, in Europe, and Israel, the Jewish international world. He is a scholar who is trained in European history right here by the Bay, someone who bridged the divide between Cal and Stanford, because he got his undergrad degree at Stanford and did his graduate studies at Berkeley. And there's not many of those, so that's uh, noteworthy. Uh, he studies the history of Zionism and modern Israel in the context of modern European and Middle Eastern history. Um, he is a wonderful scholar to dis discuss tonight's topic with us. His mo one of his most recent, uh, and he has so many publications, so I won't list them for you because we would spend the, uh, the rest of the night for that. But his, one of his most recent books is Jews and the Military a History <clears throat> with Princeton University Press. Um, and then there's many articles and more books on the history of um, Israel. Um, in conversation with him is my dear friend and colleague, Professor Stephen Zipperstein, who is the Daniel E. Koshland Professor in Jewish Culture and History at Stanford University. He also has taught at many universities in Russia, in Eastern Europe, in Europe and Israel, and of course in the United States, and at Oxford. So they share um, many uh, stations along their um, path. For 16 years, he was the founding director of the Taube Center for uh, Jewish Studies at Stanford, so I'm just a junior follow-up of Steve. He's the author of many books also. Um, the first one, The Jews of Odessa, A Cultural His History. Um, and on uh, Achat Am, Elusive Prophet, Achat Am and the Origins of, on uh, of Zionism. To many of you, he is well known. Um, and I won't list all the books he has written. I want to also point out that Steve has br branched out into other areas in Jewish history, most recently into biography, autobiographies, um, and memoirs. And he's co-editing this series on Jewish biographies with Yale University Press, which recently has won the National Jewish Book Award for editing a book series. Both of them have also been public intellectuals, have written in many um, uh, media, such as the New York Times, the New York Times Book Review, the Washington Post, the New Republic, and so on, the Jewish Review of 
uh, the Jewish Review of Books and the Chronicle of Higher Education, and the list goes on and on. So both of them are wonderful. Uh, they're both friends and wonderful conversation partner to share with us their thoughts about, uh, about an event that has shaped the 20th century and Jewish history within it. So please help me welcoming both of them to the podium, and I'm extremely grateful for them to join us. So you already know that we're friendly senior scholars. <laughs> Apparently, there are many others who are not. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, but they're not, they're not here tonight. Um, <laughs> um, so I, uh, the, the, uh, the event is, uh, 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 we, we had been promised that the lights would allow us to see your grimaces. And, um, and they, um, so if you, if you are unhappy, just grimace more, more visibly than you normally there do. You if you look and, down, uh, um, so we, um, this, this event is really inspired by uh, Derek's um, splendid uh, book published a couple of years ago on Jews in the military. Uh, I'm going to lead off by asking Derek a question or two. We'll talk, as, as Charlotte said, we're actually very close friends, and we, uh, we, 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 we play well together. <laughs> and uh, uh, let, 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 me, let me start with, with this. It's um, uh, uh, typically historians, when asked about um, our capacity to talk about the present or future, um, uh, tend to avoid uh, the uh, questions of the sort and insist that it's really hard enough for us to try to piece together something coherent about the past. But of course, when we're writing, um, and you, you tend um, to try to write um, books about things you care about deeply, you're writing in the present and about a present that you, you care about. And um, so uh, I want to just start by just reading a few lines from the beginning of Derek's book, um, the very end of his introduction, ask him to talk uh, about um, these observations. I'll then respond. I'll ask a couple of more questions. He'll ask me questions, and, and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll pass our time together. Um, um, these are academic questions. It'll be clear what they are in a moment. But they have contemporary relevance, even urgency. In recent years, Israeli governments have repeatedly presented the state as under existential threat, yet possessed of a vast and powerful army that can obliterate its foes as being the master of its own destiny, yet bereft of responsibility for its intractable conflict with the Palestinians. At the same time, diaspora Jewry has been torn between those who decry Israeli militarism and those who have few, if any, compunctions against Israeli military action of any kind. One of the distinctive aspects of modernity is the need to justify ideology and action via appeals to history. Accordingly, both the dovish and, hawkish camp, dovish and hawkish camps invoke a Jewish tradition of valorizing and seeking peace, but they do so for different reasons. The former in order to justify concessions or reconciliation with Israel's enemies, the latter to demonstrate that despite the Jews' love of peace, Israel has been backed into a corner and that its survival depends frequent, d demands frequent tough and bold military action. Both camps read the Jewish textual tradition and interpret the Jews' lived reality selectively and to their own advantage, this book aims to deconstruct simplistic, ideologically driven notions. Um, just, if, if, just if you were to flesh out what you were thinking about when you were thinking about that, um, uh, could you, uh, what, what, if, what if we start out off with, with that? Well, um I think that was quite a challenge that I set out for myself at the beginning of the book, and frankly, you know, a year and a half after the book came out, I don't know if I met it, but um, the, the problem I faced was for, for someone like myself who studies the state of Israel, I had written a good deal about various aspects of the state's formation, and every aspect about the state's contemporary situation seemed to have a historic root in, in, in the diaspora past. Obviously, Hebraic culture, which originates in, in Central and Eastern Europe, uh, the political culture of the state of Israel also has Eastern European origins. The economic structure of the state of Israel in many ways replicates uh, various forms of diaspora Jewish economic uh, activity despite attempts by the founders of the state to create a radically different economy. So in so many ways, Israel is, uh, contemporary Israel, is, is, is a product of the past. And yet there was this one thing missing, 
which is something that I think most of us who have a connection with Israel um, feel right away, which is the presence of the Israeli soldier. Uh, the Israeli army is something sui generis. And in the wake of the Holocaust, the sense that Israel represented for the first time the ability of Jews as a collective to fight. But that occurred to me, it occurred to me that nothing about Israel's past, or nothing about Israel's present, is entirely sui generis. There must have been a backstory. And this is really what the book is about. It's about how Jews have actually dealt with military power, combat, the ethical questions that come with Jews facing the horrific dilemmas of killing others, including possibly killing other Jews in battle, and the extent to which all of these questions actually informed the origins of the Israel Defense Force and continue to inform the way that Israel's army operates to this day. So it was an attempt to bridge the past and the present along with every other aspect of the country's uh, characteristics. I mean, as, as you were wrestling with the book, we, we both studied uh, with the same medieval Jewish historian, Amos Funkenstein, a, um, a, a figure uh, who, who died uh, really uh, prematurely young, but uh, a man who very much lived as a figure from the past. He um, looked remarkably like Franz Kafka, and um, you know, which is is not what every Jewish boy try, <laughs> how every Jewish boy tries to look. And um, there's a lot one admires about Franz Kafka, but perhaps not that. And um, and uh, incredibly, incredibly um, uh, brilliant um, um, uh, man. Um, he 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 argued, and I, I was just wondering whether you were just ruminating over this argument of his. Uh, while working on the book. I remember his making the case about how foolish it is to believe that Jews in the past uh, went as the saying, that wretched saying goes, like sheep to the slaughter. And of course, uh, Jews responded to threats in the past in all sorts of ways. And the response of Jews in the modern age to, um, to violence is almost argued inordinately a byproduct of the fact that they their wager with modernity. They actually, they believed, as they were told, that they were citizens of states. And so, um, and, um, and why disbelieve, disbelieve that? And so the uh, Jewish response during the Second World War, in many ways no different from the response of Russian soldiers when, 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 when taken captive by Nazis, was not a byproduct, he argued, of a diaspora mentality, but more a byproduct of citizenship, of modernity. Is, is this something you've, you circled around, because you, you dealt with, it's a, it's a book written across a broad chronological swath. And um, was this, did this argument hold up as you were writing the well, book? Well, it's funny, you should mention the late Amos Funkenstein, who does continue. There, there was a point early in the book, I think it's in the first chapter, where I, I was literally trying to channel Amos. And, and I could sort of see that Kafka-like visage. Just, just, it, it just, it just, I mean, uh, uh, most, writers actually have acknowledged that the surest key to writer's block is to try to challenge Kafka. So, uh, so yeah, but, but go, on, go on, go on, go on. Um, yeah. and, and precisely this notion that, as, as almost wrote in, in his little book on Maimonides, the difference between pacifism and passivity, which is enormous, that yes, the Jews have a, a, a tradition in their textual tradition of passivity, of awaiting a messianic redeemer. But that is completely different from pacifism. The Jewish tradition is not a pacifist tradition. It is very different from the tradition of some of the Christian sectarian movements, and Quakers, various Anabaptist movements that are ideologically opposed to war. And the Jewish tradition is not ideologically opposed to war. If Jews in the Middle Ages did not make war, it's because they were not in the right political circumstances to do so. They were not members of the body politic. They were not um, mercenaries, or they were rarely mercenaries. They were not subject to corvée, to uh, you know, quotas for military service. But when they do become modern citizens, as you're saying, they become subject to the demands of the modern state. And most of them go into the army. They don't necessarily want to. Most people don't really want to go into the army when they're called up, but they go. Very much like their non-Jewish fellow citizens. And they perform the role of citizens with varying levels of uh, reluctance or willingness or bloodthirstiness or, uh, or qualms. But they are performing very much, as you say, 
as citizens, because there's nothing in the Jewish tradition, even if they were zealously adhering to it, that would militate against it. There's the, obviously the exception of Russian Jews, many of whom tried to get out of military service, but the fact is lots of non-Jews right, tried to get out of the army as well. You, you, use the, you, use, you rely at one point on that well-known Yiddish saying, if you want to understand Jews, look at the Christians near them. And it's a saying that wasn't, wasn't actually, doesn't originate in, in America. It actually originates in Eastern Europe. Um, and yet, I mean, on, on some level, in, in reading your book and thinking about some of the themes, especially about the preponderance of Jews drawn to the most radical forms of radicalism, um, the way in which a city like Bialystok was known as one of the great centers of Jewish anarchism with the sort of wildest and wooliest of Jewish radicals. And um, the, um, I, I think, uh, if I'm not mistaken, um, um, some 1,500 uh, Russian um, bureaucrats, some rather high level, are assassinated in the years between 1903 and 1906. And a, a fair number of them um, um, uh, killed uh, by, 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 by Jews. You have one paragraph where you actually, you list various well-known Jews who, are, who were in Russia assassins. And um, I, 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 was it actually true that Manya Shok had actually cut that body up and put it in a, in a suitcase and sent it to a, yeah. A, yeah. Well, so, but, but um, he, yeah, he so, was, to her, cre to her credit, he, he was an informer for the third section. Right, right, so, right, right, you know. right. Uh, yeah, I'm, 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 uh, Manya Shok then eventually moves to Palestine. She's tricked by her brother who says that he's ill. The father's worried about her being too much of a radical, I think perhaps after this luggage thing. And, um, and, um, and, um, and she ends up becoming one, one of the most famous of all of Zionists. In many ways, it's her and her, her husband who devise, or at least shape in many ways, the whole idea of the kibbutz. They're crucial in the creation of the Haganah. All, all, also, um, I mean, there's, there's a way in which, um, I mean, the, the, the way in which Jews, not only in, in Russia, but in Central Europe, too, to some extent in Italy, too, gravitate toward radical politics, and in some, some sense, the most radical of radical politics is, a, is an issue that many of us as, as, as historians have wrestled with and tried to explain to some extent in Russia. It seems to be a byproduct of the preponderance of Jews living in cities and radicals. Radicals mostly come out of cities. The way in which Jews are just... Have I said something? On, on, it's uh, more, <laughs> more yeah. yeah, this, this, this code. Always, this always no, happens when this topic cell. comes up. The, um, <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Even even paranoids have enemies. The um, 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 the um, you know to some extent the preponderance of, of Jews in schools and schools are the natural spawning ground of radicalism. Right. But how how would you flesh flesh this 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 out? Well, I think it's it's exactly the, the other side of the coin. That on the one hand you have sort of the Jew as a docile body, uh, a citizen, a member of the body politic. They get drafted and they, they go into the army like everybody else, and that's part of the story. But there's also a part of the story in which Jews are more educated, more urban, more mobile, and it can take two then very different forms. In a country like France or Italy, maybe Austria, Hungary, where Jews have all sorts of career opportunities and are relatively emancipated, they can become generals and colonels and run armies, which they do. Dreyfus, the famous Captain Alfred Dreyfus, was at the bottom of the food chain among French Jewish officers at the time of the Dreyfus Affair. There were 20 Jewish generals in the uh, late uh, 19th, early 20th century. On the other hand, in Eastern Europe, you're going to have Jews who, for all sorts of sociological reasons you referred to, are inclined to radicalism. And again, there are no theological, ideological uh, inhibitions to engaging in violent action, which they do rather spectacular. There's the case of Manya Sholchat. Um, there's also the case of um, uh, the founder of the, future founder of the Palestine Electric Company. Right. You know, uh, Rutenberg, who had taken part in the execution of Father Gapon. Yeah. Um, this a lot of people is, felt yeah. Gapon deserved it, too. But. Maybe. <laughs> I'm just saying that there is, a, um, there is simply a willingness to engage in the use of force, whether it be in the name of the state or whether it be against the state. And that's really the, the two sides of the, of the coin. It's the Jew is soldier and the, and, and, and the Jew is rebel. But they both suggest a certain amount of agency and action, as opposed to what I think we, we still think of as a sort of Jewish, not just textual, but also historic tradition of, of, of passive, passivity. Uh, when I mentioned to my 
when, whenever I have a question about Jewish learning, I turn to my accountant. And I was talking to my accountant last month about my Canadian taxes, which would make you all grateful to be Americans. And he said, what was your book about that sold you know, 12 copies last year? And, and, <laughs> and I said, it's about Jews and armed force. And he said, oh, it must be a very short book until you got to the chapter on Israel. Right. And then I said, aha. So, so I was, I was raised by accountant, and I <laughs> fled, which is why I do what I do. <laughs> but but um, uh, just one, one last general question before we get to the First, first World War. Um, so I know now you're writing a book on Herzl. I know that because I commissioned it for the Jewish Life series. And um, the, um, there's that extraordinary moment. I mean, there's so many extraordinary counterintuitive moments in Herzl's life. But there's that moment where um, he's responding to a letter sent to the chief rabbi of Paris, uh, a letter sent after his 1898 visit to Palestine, Herzl's visit. Uh, the letter sent by Yusuf um, Khalidi, mm -hmm. the mayor of Jerusalem, right. and um, who uh, writes uh, Tzadok Khan, Tzadok Khan, the, um, the um, chief rabbi of Paris, and, and, and says that, you know, in the abstract, one understands Zionism, except is, there are ab abstract ideas that just can't work out. And this one can't work out in some measure, of course, because there are people in this land. And, um, and, 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 and Herzl writes back um, a note that contradicts almost every single um, um, a word in your, in, your, in your book on the military. He writes back, as I recall, and he says, um, the Jews are a, uh, they're a, a people of pacifism. Um, they, they haven't picked up arms in thousands of years. They don't know how to do it. And, um, and, um, and you'll have no problem with us. He, he actually, as, as I understand it, he's so moved by this exchange uh, with Yosef Ch uh, Khalidi that he writes a Yosef Khalidi uh, character as the one um, mm. Arab character into his novel *Old New Land*, um, *Alt Nyland*, which um, and 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 an and Arab who's, who's who's ecstatic about Jewish immigration to Palestine, um, um, and the, the novel takes place um, um, somewhere <coughs> 20 years after um, the the, the um, somewhere in the 1920s. Um, we know that Herzl writes lots of things, right. and Herzl sometimes means what he writes, kind of half means what he writes. I, how much? How much thought did he give to question about Jewish pacifism, about arms, about, because um, he also talks about the Jews becoming new Maccabees. And, mm -hmm. um, and um, so, um, I mean, there'll be Maccabees without swords. I mean, what is he? Or with swords, or, yeah. Yeah, what, are, what is he? Well, it's a problem. You know, everybody says different things at different times, and people, all people contradict themselves, except when they don't. And, um, <laughs> And people who become political leaders are even more likely to contradict themselves. And people as psychologically, let's say, in technical terms, uh, vermished. Yeah. As Herzl, even more so. And the problem is that when he was a younger man, we you, talked. You said that lovingly. Lovingly. <laughs> Great. No, truly. I mean, he's a fascinating, right. fascinating, yeah. deeply interesting person. Yeah. When he first becomes a Zionist, and he's writing about Zionist matters in 1895 and 1896, he talks about an army. He talks about a military conquest of what will be the future Jewish state. He uses very militaristic language privately, talking to himself, as it were. And also when he talks with Maurice de Hirsch, he talks about how the Jews have to be made strong for war. Something happens in the two years. There's a certain maturation. Herzl realizes the consequences, the implication of what he's doing. And what he writes in that exchange with Yusuf al-Khalidi is something he repeats over and over again in the remaining years of his life, particularly in 1898. In the same year as the Second Zionist Congress, and he says, and I'm quoting, we Jews have never been a political power, and we will never be a political power again. This is the founder of the Zionist organization and the founder of political Zionism. So he has a certain vision that is very different from this kind of uh, frustrated, I think, search for glory and for masculine pride that he was scribbling in his diary when he was just two or three years younger. So Herzl embodies really these contradictions of a man who wants Jews to be proud, and he's obsessed with masculinity, but he's not necessarily going to define that in terms of military power. Right. Let's, um, we, we, we promised him um, World War I. to talk in the First World War. Right. Um, so it, 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 it's, I don't know if you'd agree, but it seems to me striking the extent to which the First World War 
has left surprisingly sparse um, imprint on, on Jewish collective memory. It, um, it, it seems certainly true in the world that I know best, in the world of the former Russian Empire, in which, of course, the war doesn't end really in 1918. It really doesn't end until 1921 and with the consolidation of the borders of, of Bolshevik Russia. It's a, um, um, in the years, uh, say, between 1918 and 1919, probably as many as 100,000 Jews are butchered. We have no idea how many. Um, in, there's, it's likely, and there's more and more evidence that we're actually um, drawing out of archives that um, as many, if not more, women are raped. And uh, most of the cases unreported, certainly vastly underreported. And, um, and, and yet, there's not a single place name that one could think of, of a place where Jews are massacred in this period that resonates to the same extent that Kishinev resonates, mm -hmm. where 44 Jews were killed right. and five died of, of wounds um, subsequently. Um, uh, nowhere. And, um, and, um, and that seems to be, by and large, true yeah. of so much about the, the, the war. To some extent, it just doesn't fit. In other words, Dreyfus fits. A humiliated Jewish officer fits, because that's what happens to us. But, um, but to have, as you describe in your book, um, all these Jewish officers in Italy um, doesn't fit. And um, to have so many Jews mobilized during the First World War and to be patriots somehow doesn't fit into Jewish collective, to collective memory. I wonder also if part of the problem is that there's not clearly good guys and bad guys. And um, everyone ends up being interspersed. Even, even a, a sensible pogromist like Petlura right. is able, it's not clear to what extent he's controlling his own, his own people. And yeah. so um, it's just striking the way in which marking this event, it's hard to think, it's hard to think of a single book um, um, a single book that is actually tells the story of Jews in the First World War across the um, expanse of, 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 of Europe. I, I, I can't think of any. No, it's, this is, um, it's a terrific question, which is always when an academic says it's a terrific question, it means it's a very difficult question, and I don't really think I can answer it. And, and you, and, and you, and you yeah. ask it because you have absolutely no idea how you'd be but, able to. No, you, 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 but I, having, I, having said that, I, I, I think I'd rephrase it a little yeah. bit. Yeah, okay. Because I think it depends, which is also a nice way of saying I disagree. I know. Um, <laughs> it's, <laughs> I, I, I've been around the block. And we both, <laughs> and we both lived in England. We both lived in England yeah. where people are always saying one thing and, you know. So, yeah. Okay. When I when I, li I lived there for six years, I, I taught there years ago in the in the 80s, and I and I came to figure out that there were three distinct meanings for the word quite. It could mean yes, it could mean no, and it could mean you're an idiot. <laughs> quite. Yeah, yeah. Quite. Quite. <laughs> so, what, I, what 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 did he say? <laughs> so, I think there's a few issues. One is Kishinev takes place in a era of global peace, more or less at a time when the institutions of Jewish global politics are taking form, particularly the Zionist movement, but also in this country, you've got the American Jewish Committee, you've got um, a kind of global international political system aborning. Kichinev shocks the world precisely because it is one of an era of relative peace, and it's an incident that the world can react to, particularly the Jewish world. Then you have the chaos of the First World War, and you have the mass killings in the long war, as it were, the after war, 1918, 1921. It's utter chaos, and not only for Jews. And it's not, what I would ask is comparatively, not just the 100,000 plus Jews who die, but the entire carnage, the, right. the swell of right. blood of Poles, Ukrainians, Russians, who die by the millions in this, in this period. And then there's the question of the opacity of the Soviet Union concealing access to sources after the war, and the fact that after the war, institutions like the Jewish Joint Distribution Committee are so busy just trying to reconstruct Jewish lives in Poland that they're not steeping themselves in the sources to try to figure out what happened. After World War II, it's a bit different because, to put it quite simply, the Holocaust is perpetrated by Germans. Mm -hmm. And they leave behind records. And there's a vast body of emigre scholars who came from Germany to this country in the 1930s and who assiduously assiduously followed 
its story and culminating in the early 1960s with uh, the destruction of European Jewry, uh, Raoul Hilberg. So I think what you're talking about is such a tremendous level of chaos and an inaccessibility of sources, but not, not an inaccessibility of memory. For example, in this city, the events of 1918 to 1921 for the Jews might not be part of collective memory. Toronto would be a different story. Right. Right. In Toronto, the name Peklera will mean an right. awful lot in the Jewish community, which is largely Polish and more recently arrived than in this city. So I think there are distinctions yeah. from one place to another. Yeah, I think the one, the one aspect of the First World War that continues to resonate and is likely to resonate more and more um, is, um, is the Balfour Declaration. Mm. And it, it increasingly, I think a lot of talk about Israel is no longer talk about the sins of 1947-48, where there's a general consensus with regard to basically what happened, the chronology, and more and more talk really about the true original sin and uh, the Balfour Declaration. Um, and, um, uh, and so um, I think we're, we're seeing that in certain circles preoccupied with Israel. Um, my guess is there'll be, there's, there's, there's one could see um, a shift in the tenor of the way in which the Middle Eastern world that gave birth to Balfour and the other contradictory um, promises is written about in the most, in this recent book by Anderson that you and I have talked about, um, uh, Lawrence in Arabia, yeah. I think it's called. Um, the Weizmann in this book, the Chaim Weizmann, who of course plays a central role in the consolidation of the Balfour Declaration issued in November 1917 and that the British seem by and large to have despaired about by already by 1919 or 1920. Um, um, the, the Weizmann in, in this book is a very different Weizmann that I've ever encountered b before. It really is an example of the way in which even good historians, in this case as a journalist, write very much in the presence. This Weizmann is a, is a conniving uh, character. He's, um, he knows he's after a state, but he's not going to say it. And there's something, there's something noxious um, uh, about that. Um, um, this Weizmann is, is a character who's pulled something over on the British. And um, so, um, I mean, in many ways, as the, the Middle East that was shaped and consolidated in many ways by, in the waning days of the First World War, is now we're seeing it come apart. And so naturally, there's going to be a, um, an overall focus on that Middle East and how it came about, and, um, and in no small measure because of the special scrutiny that Israel has come under in recent years, in particular focus, it seems to me, on the way in which, on that promise from the British. Does that make sense? It, it, it does make sense in terms of how perhaps a lot of people are perceiving it. I don't think it's, it's accurate or fair. No, no, I'm not, not talking about it. But it's yeah, certainly how, yeah. 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 Um, I mean, because what is missing from this is um, the laws of unintended consequences. Right. I mean, during the First World War, the British are throwing out a million things. Uh, Palestine for the Jews, and of course the, the, the motivations for the Balfour Declaration are so many and so complicated and contradictory. And unclear, we're still unclear. Unclear, well, unclear. because the yeah. problem is, again, it gets back to, we were talking about human motivations and contradictory uh, quality of human statements. Uh, security, imperial interests, philo-Semitism, and exaggerated beliefs. And I, I believe in, I would never call Weizmann during the war conniving. Mm -hmm. I would say that he was trying to uh, present the Zionist cause to the British in a way that they would accept it. And one was to never disabuse the British of their own exaggerated views of Jewish power. Yeah. For example, yeah. the power of Jews to keep Russia in the war or to get America into the war. And Weizmann yeah. didn't bother telling them that actually he didn't have the power to yeah. do either. It's, it's, well, it's a curious thing because yeah. in many ways the Balfour Declaration and the Protocols of the Elders of Zion um, are, are lubricated by the same um, misperceptions. I um, mean, the protocols are, 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 are cobbled together, of course, based largely uh, just they're a forgery drawn from a, an anti-Napoleon III um, um, uh, uh, um, uh, a document uh, written, um, written years before. They're, 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 they're written in 1903 by general consensus, but they don't have much legs. They don't, they don't, ha they don't have much um, uh, resonance uh, until, um, until um, the 1917-1918. The 
and 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 it's then that they 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 get worldwide notoriety and actually come to be seen as perhaps accurate from the vantage point of otherwise perfectly sensible people, momentarily even Winston Churchill. And mm -hmm. um, and so, but, but both Balfour and the protocols are in a sense, um, um, the, the, the watering both of them is this exaggerated notion of the amount of power that Jews have. And, um, and, um, and, and Weizmann, uh, in my mind rather cleverly, in the minds of some others rather craftily, um, is able to pull at those strings in order to in order to achieve this diplomatic victory. Yes, and the but I think in this country really isn't it? It's really only nineteen. When does Henry Ford publish his version of the it's protocols afterwards. in the it's, uh, the Dear Born Independent? Yeah, I think it's twenties. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So again, it takes a little while, and I think it's precisely because of the chaos of the war and because of the destruction of all of the great European. Uh, empires, the four empires, if you include the Ottoman Empire, this sense of utter chaos and the search for a universal solvent. And that's really what the protocols are all about, is presenting the Jews as a kind of a universal solvent. So it appears to explain uh, what was really ultimately an inexplicable phenomenon. Just as the Balfour Declaration, uh, I forget, it was Seeley who said that the British acquired their empire in a fit of absent-mindedness. Mm -hmm. And I remember lecturing about this in Oxford where uh, we know in the United Kingdom things do happen in a fit of absent-mindedness, which explains... But to acquire so much, you, I mean, you know... You, well, yeah. maybe not the whole empire. <laughs> but the... Um, no, I mean, in some ways, it's, 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 it's quite duplicitous. Yeah. Um, it's not benign. Uh, promising Palestine to the Jews, promising an Arab kingdom to the Sharif of Mecca, uh, dividing up the Middle East into spheres of influence with the French, and just sort of throwing all these things out, and then waiting for after the war, and then seeing what's left. Well, the Sharif of Mecca is gone. He's been overthrown by, um, you know, Abdul Aziz ibn Saud. And the, but the Jews are still there. And for a whole variety of reasons, the Balfour Declaration is actually included into the terms of the British Mandate for Palestine, which then makes it very difficult for Palestinians to collaborate with the mandatory authority the way that Arabs do with other mandatory authorities or other post-World War I uh, ongoing imperial regimes throughout the Arab world. So yes, in, in a way, 1970, I wouldn't call it the original sim, but I would say 1917 is the moment at which the British make a commitment, which they honor for 22 years, yeah, yeah. and without which, without right. which, there simply could not have been a state of Israel. Yeah, of course. So if, um, just moving toward a conclusion, I mean, if we were to pinpoint during this period of marking the First World War, and in, 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 our, in our case, the, its impact on, on Jews. If we were to begin to sort of identify what might most, um, what's, what the most, most important aspects to remember um, uh, about the war and about its impact, in particular on Jewish life. I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll um, you go first, but, um, where would you begin? Well, the war destroys the imperial dynastic principle, which had been a mixed bag for the Jews. It had worked reasonably well for them in the Habsburg Empire and in the Ottoman Empire, and even in the German Empire. There's limits. There are certain things Jews can't do. But by and large, it would work well for them. To me, the real touchstone, and so this is why I'm glad you're going to offer the other half, <laughs> is the Russian Empire because the situation of the Jews there is, even if we accept a lot of the revisionist historiography, it's still pretty grim. Mm -hmm. And then you get the destruction of this imperial system and the replacement with, on the one hand, a nation state system, which can be very bad for the Jews because successor states in Eastern Europe are virulently chauvinistically nationalist. On the other hand, you get a new kind of empire. You get an ideological empire in the form of the Soviet Union in which the Jews now are, are emancipated <laughs> And they're able to achieve for a period of time in ways that they hadn't. So I see the war as having overturned a certain system which had been beneficial for Jews in much of the world, but perhaps not in one. And then as it were, in the post-war period, the tables are turned. So I turn it to the, the expert yeah. on Russia. Who yeah, I mean, it, you know, I think part of the reason why the First World War tends to recede into the background in Jewish collective memory um, at least part of the reason has to do with our not knowing what to do with the fate of Jews in Russia. Because, um, of course, in, in, in the immediate wake of the revolution, 
and even in the immediate wake of the victory of Bolshevism, um, it, um, what's happened as seen by Jews after Russia comes out of this carnage and chaos, and, and I, I, I take your point that chaos is incredibly difficult to write about, and by and large, the situation between late 1917, even mid-1917, and 1920 is one basically of chaos. Other historians of Russia have managed to do it, and no Jewish historian has managed to tell the Jewish story mm -hmm. of it, and so chaos can be written about. Um, in, in, um, but, but leaving that aside, um, I, um, I think part of the problem is that it, um, our understanding of the fate of Jews in Russia is, a, is of, a, of a disastrous story. And of course, as seen by and large by Jews, not only on the hard left, in the 20s and the 30s, and God knows in the 40s, the story was not a disastrous one. Mm -hmm. it, was, um, it was in many ways an extraordinary and ironic one. And, um, and that narrative ends up being turned inside out, not only by the Cold War, but also by what we learn was actually happening within Soviet Russia under Stalin and before. And so to some extent, I think the Jewish narrative has never come to terms with the um, with what happens to Russian Jewry in the wake of 1917. And subsequently, there ends up being these separate stories where the Jewish story ends up being told by the Zionists or by the Jewish socialist labor Bundists. And then the other communist story ends up being told by other people. But until 1921, and in many ways until well into the 20s, it was all one story. And um, they're all sitting in the same room arguing with one another. And um, it's what happens later on that ends up creating these different narratives. And so I think part of what bedevils the writing of at least the East European Russian Jewish side of the story, what bedevils it is that we don't know what to do with the Jewish romance with communism, and, uh, or at least the Jewish romance with Bolshevism, which is a real romance. And um, now it, it turns out, you know, like many romantic stories, we didn't know the whole story, you know, um, but, um, but it was a, a deep embrace. And I, I think that's part of why this has remained a kind of dark continent, I think. Very much, um, and, then, and then after World War II, so much attention is then focused yeah. on the utter catastrophe, the annihilation of two-thirds of European Jewry, and so then the events of 1918 to 1921 recede, even though now this is changing. We have a brilliant young historian of Russian Jewry and Soviet Jewry who's going to tackle right. a major right. archive-based uh, story of this period during the Russo-Polish-Ukrainian so wars. Just one last question. Maybe both of us to chew over, and then we'll just open up for for discussion and questions. Um, you, you start your book, um, I think in a synagogue, actually. And um, you're in a synagogue. Rarely, rarely. Oh, okay, I, well, I wasn't, oh, I, sorry, I, I, I wasn't, I wasn't asking. Okay. You, 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 you don't lose points in San Francisco <laughs> by saying that. <laughs> uh, uh, so um, you start your book in a synagogue right. where you're giving a, a talk about Jews, the military. And, um, and, and, um, and, and there's, uh, there are veterans. They're veterans of the Second World War who actually stand up, or you ask them to stand up, I can't quite recall, and, um, and they get a kind of polite you know, um, a response. And then someone actually in the room is a veteran of, of, of the Haganah or of Machal, the, um, the, the, the uh, uh, a, foreign, a, a, a foreigner who is fighting, and, and, and this person gets a resound, resounding applause. You begin your book with Israel, you end your book with the drafting of, 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 of ultra-Orthodox Jews. Right. Um, and um, how, do you, how do you control, as a historian, um, the, um, the Yetzer Hora, the evil inclination of thinking about the present, when one knows one is living in the present and thinking about the present, and yet writing about the past? And um, in, in a book that begins with today, and ends with today and acknowledges your abiding preoccupations with today and what's going to come tomorrow. I think we have to be honest. I think it's something that we're all doing as historians. We are all writing from the present. We're writing from a particular subject position. And we're trying to answer questions that even if they are purely historical questions, they have some relevance, or they should have some relevance, or meaning, for, for the present. And in my own work, and it's a bit idiosyncratic, but um, I'm writing about Israel even when I'm not writing about Israel. 
That is, this is a book that goes back into the 1600s and covers a lot of different sp space and time to try to help us understand questions about the origins and the development of, of the state and how we think about the state. So Israel is, is present. I think the real problem would be if we let our present concerns dictate not only our passion, but not only the questions we ask, but the means by which we answer those questions and the answers that we come up with. Mm -hmm. And this is where we have to leave the way open to find out all sorts of things that might not fit into the pre-existing you know, hypotheses. And it is a book that has its own complexities and, and it wanders along its own, its own pathways. But I really, I would think that particularly in our field, maybe not people who work on, I don't know, the cloth industry in medieval Flanders. If there's any medieval, you know, low countries historians in the room, I apologize. <laughs> but I think for what you and I do, there is no question that we are driven into our work by, by passion. And it is a passion that is deeply presentist. But we at the same time have a responsibility, a professional uh, responsibility, to not hold back from any possible answers we come up with, which means that much of what we come up with will be discomforting. Mm -hmm. It'll be discomforting to us and even more so perhaps to, to our readers. Yeah. But we, it's simply we can't, something we have to we do. We can't stop. I think I, think I, I always wince. This, this often happens in political campaigns when, when a, uh, someone who's campaigning and whose talk has been particularly unsuccessful and has been partic and hasn't reached and hasn't actually moved the audience when that talk is called academic and um, <laughs> you know yeah. um, and yeah. uh, and the, the fact is is that just under the surface of what we've learned um, uh, we've disciplined ourselves to actually to, to to do with as much rigor and as much honesty as we're capable of is. Um, are, are, are the deepest of passions. And you, you can't sustain this kind of work for decades if I can't imagine sustaining it unless you care deeply about it. And at the same time, um, if all we did was to, it was to spill onto the page how deeply we feel, feel about what we feel like, we wouldn't be writing history. No, we'd and be on Facebook. We, we, <laughs> we, and, and, people, and more people would read us. So, um, so. With that, could we turn on the lights? And I do want to mention that um, I, um, so at a, at a birthday party of one of my dearest friends, a friend I've known for 45 years, um, um, there was a woman there at the party. She mentioned she worked here at the JCC and that her family was from Bialystok. And I told her somehow, somewhere in my talk, I would mention the, the city of Bialystok. Okay. And, um, and I did it without actually um, uh, I did it seamlessly, all right? <laughs> and, and so um, I, I was just, just wanted to take that moment to boast. And um, um, so did, did we that. say anything to inspire any questions and uh, comments? Um, uh, perhaps the first comment from, from Charles Michael. I have a question in regard to the fact that there are several members of the state of Israel that have refused to serve in the military. How would you deal with that? If you uh, were the, if you were Netanyahu, uh, uh, um, so that's that's a fantasy I've never had, <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and I'll 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 admit. Um, um, uh, do, do you want to speak about your fantasies? Uh, no, I, I think my brief references to passion sufficed. <laughs> um, the, there is a, an interesting history about the lack of conscientious objection as a category, or the whole problem of conscientious objection as a category in the IDF. The notion of a country in arms born in duress and um, f uh, apparently uh, fighting a, a kind of constant war against its enemies does not predispose a country to favor the concept of conscientious objection. But, uh, but there are Israelis, as there are people in any country, who refused to serve in the military. I mean, that's not at all unusual. During World War II in the United States, there were scores of thousands of Christians, 40,000, I think, who refused to serve in the US military as they were conscientious objectors. There were 600 Jews in the United States who were conscientious objectors. The ratio was much smaller for Jews for some of the reasons I talked about, I talked about earlier. So I think we have to understand this particular aspect, not perhaps as part of a Jewish past, so now I'm contradicting the whole argument of my book, but that's what Jews do. We argue something and then we passionately argue the opposite. Is that there are aspects of Israel. You don't want to do within 45 minutes. So, I mean. <laughs> <laughs> there, there, there are aspects of Israel's uh, contemporary political situation that are, that are new. 
And one is that it is a state engaged in a conflict that not everyone in the country agrees with and that inspires very strong passions. And there are some, a very small minority I should point out, but there are some uh, who choose to refuse to serve. But this is very different, very different from the historic sort of revulsion to the military that may have been Russian Jews experience who were afraid of not being able to observe Kashrut or the Sabbath or whatever. This, this is something, this is very political. It's, it's not about religious observance or about the loss of their cultural identity. It's something, I think but it's something it's, new. It's interesting, even, even in what it was that Russian Jews remembered about the m m most um, troublesome period, the so-called Cantonist period, mm. uh, um, uh, started under Nicholas II, the, it, the, the legislation is implemented in 1827, a couple of years after it becomes Tsar, it continues uh, in, in, into the time of the Crimean War, uh, where um, young, um, in, in disproportionately large number of underage Jewish boys are, are conscripted into the army. The, um, the whole Cantonist story actually becomes, by the late imperial period, um, they're th writing about is it really takes takes assumes a role very similar to that of Holocaust literature in um, in um, in Jewish life um, in in the Western world beginning in the 70s and 80s. But so much and the 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 the, the period leaves such a searing um, impact on Jews in Russia that when um, there are um, efforts at collecting folk songs songs um, that Jews sing. Um, the first comprehensive collection has as many songs about the Cantonist period as love songs. And love songs are the staple of, of, of songs. And, um, and yet, there's so much about this Cantonist period that ends up being excised um, in, in Jewish memory. By and large, those responsible for conscripting Jews are um, the heads of Jewish communities. And um, with, um, with the children of the wealthy or the children of the learning being um, 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 absolved um, from, from conscription. Um, this causes enormous tension, as we now know within communities. And by and large, once the, the story ends up being written, so much of what was the story ends up not being part of the story. That's, that's a, lot of what, a lot of what we do as historians. We tell uh, family stories that families don't want to hear. And, um, and um, that's a, 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 that, in, in, in a way, if I were to identify, maybe the reason why we're invited out to so few dinner parties is, <laughs> is, 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 just, is just, just for that, that reason. That's, by and large, what we do. We open up, we, we pick up a rock, and we look at what was actually not talked about for reasons of shame and embarrassment. If one focuses just on that, one is an, one is an obsessive. If one doesn't concentrate on that at all, one is a poor historian. And um, yeah, I, I forget how, how we got, got, got onto well, that. Yeah. Let me just, uh, a quick follow up, by the way. Two years ago, one of my students sent me from Jerusalem a, a flyer, a PDF of a flyer that's been passed around in Mea Sharim and other ultra-Orthodox neighborhoods against the proposals to draft mm. Haredi Jews. And it shows beefy, burly, muscular Jews, um, Orthodox Jews, but Orthodox Jews wearing IDF uniforms, and they look quite Gentile. And they are throwing into uh, carts. They're throwing young Hasidic boys into these trundle carts. And they are recreating the imagery oh of God. the Cantonists my God. In, in 2012, uh, and I'll God. send you the. That's um, incredible. I say it's in the next AJS perspectives. I have really? a piece on this. Uh, yeah, it's just, uh, it, it's amazing. They are, they are living or reliving the memories of 180, 180 years ago. Extraordinary. So, yeah. We have a question back here. Thank you. Um, could you give me the, or give us the name of the person you referred to that's doing the archivist studies uh, for uh, the j role of Jews in the war from um, 1918 to 21? Yeah, well, in particular, yeah. uh, if there's a focus on the military involvement of those Jews and, and mm. secondly, the anti-Semitism that was rampant in that period. The, 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 w I, one of the words dropped. What, what involvement? Uh, the involvement, involvement of the Jews, Jews either in, in the military, because they were drafted, they were serving in the Polish and the Russian, the German armies, they were serving against each other in, right. in some ways. And then secondly, 
the endemic anti-Semitism, particularly in Poland and the Ukraine, yeah. where uh, these same Jews that were serving the country were subject to great uh, oppression. Yeah, I mean, there's, I mean, Derek was referring to the work of a colleague of ours, Jeffrey Weidlinger, who teaches at University of Michigan, a very good Russian Jewish um, social historian, but a, um, a, a graduate student who just finished a PhD at Brandeis, um, Irina, I forget her last name, actually just went through, um, there are all kinds of local reports sent by communities um, in what is now the Ukraine um, during the um, in period between 1918, 1919, and she apparently has, with some degree of authority, managed to um, calculate the number of women who were raped. And the, 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 the number is just enormous. I mean, really, really enormous, far greater than we ever would have imagined, though we should have imagined the unimaginable. Um, the, um, there are several scholars um, who are working on, um, on unpacking both the origin and the resonance of the Protocols of the Elders of Zion. And um, which, um, as I said, though written before, um, it, it's actually um, the, the protocols end up having the greatest impact, in part, in part you don't really need, if you have any of you have read through them, and it's, it's a pretty much a waste of time, it's, um, they're, they're massively repetitive, which is part of um, the reason why they actually have the resonance that they have, because yeah. you don't really have to read through all them. And so the way in which they're actually distributed initially within the white army, the army fighting the reds, is they're torn up into separate pages. And you don't need to read more than one page. And um, we have copies at the Hoover of these torn up protocols that were just passed around to, um, to anti-Bolshevik um, forces. I, I suspect also that part of the reason for the resonance of the protocols has to do with the way in which it's, um, it's all voice. It's the voice of the elder. And to some extent, it's the same attractiveness, though not to conflate the difference, the same attractiveness that talk radio has. Because you, you're, not, um, you're not reading, it's not a third-hand account. It's a voice that's talking to you in the way that that horrible, hectoring voice speaks on talk radio. I did collapse the distinction just now, didn't I? And, um, and, um, and I think that's part of the reason why it actually has the resonance that it, it has. And there's several people who are putting, put, studying that and connecting that to the kind of massive cauldron of hatred um, that ends up bursting in the midst of the, the Russian Revolution, of course, against the backdrop of, of a moment where suddenly Jews who are sidelined in imperial Russia, um, in some instances, are at um, the helm of power. And it's an astonishing moment. It's, and the Bolsheviks really, up until the moment that they up until the moment they begin to gain some sort of political visibility mid mid-1917, they're seen about as powerful as, say, um, a, a, a group in Berkeley in the mid-1970s um, uh, in, in front of, front of, front of Sproul Hall. And so the notion that they actually would take over the country with the la largest land mass, land mass in all of Europe is utterly counterintuitive. And so the question remains, how did it happen? How did this extraordinary disaster happen? People are casting about for explanations. And that's part of the background to the residents of the protocols. And there's that book, is it Alexander Prusin? has a very nice book right. about the uh, Russian zone of occupation, and he also talks about the after the post-war period. He's got a wonderful, I mean, it's a terrible story of the Lvov pogrom. But um, the, in this sense, I mean, you're alluding to Jews being caught in between, you know, trying desperately to be neutral in these fights between, in this case, you know, Poles, Ukrainians, whatever, and then ultimately suffering. And he does a kind of micro-history that is, um, is it's very good. Uh, and then what is Oleg? Budnitsky. Budnitsky also about Jews in the... Yeah, exactly. Russian Civil War. So. Next question back here. OK, um, I'm an Americanist. So I've been working on World War I, but looking at the home front and looking at uh, Americans that fought. I have a great uncle, actually, who was a doctor. And I have a lot of his letters from the battlefield wow. talking about yeah. Passover and what he mm -hmm. did and all that sort of thing and using biblical references. Mm. But my great fun lately has been reading the American Israelite mm -hmm. reformed new Jewish newspaper out of Cincinnati for the war years. Yeah. And their editorial is all about patriotism, mm -hmm. yeah. is all about you are becoming a better American when you are joining the military 
And not only that, but you were becoming more of an equal. You were getting to know your fellow Americans. Mm -hmm. So I'm very thankful for your presentations, and I'm curious if you have any comments on the American aspect of being a Jew in the military. In World War I in particular, or? Well, one thing that I find very strange, it gets back to your point about 1918 to 1921 and this kind of amnesia, is that if you do internet searches for Jews in World War I, you will almost immediately be sent to websites on the Jews in World War II. <laughs> that there's a massive amount of material, both printed and online, about Jews in the American forces in World War II. There's far, far less about Jews in the American forces in World War I. Now, we know the United States entered the war late, and its involvement was relatively limited, Jewish involvement relatively limited, but still. Um, and there's a woman named Jessica Cooperman who's done wonderful work about. OK. So you know about her book, and then Chris uh, Sturba, the one who compares Italians and Jews. And it's not that much. But one thing I would just caution, and this is true for, in general for any country, but you know, the United States in World War I is a nice example. It's one thing to read it, the American Israelite and you read a newspaper editorial which says, you know, we Jews, we're going to go and fight to be patriots and to prove our worthiness as citizens and to integrate into the United States. Then there's the actual lived reality of the Jew who gets his draft notice and has to go to the induction board and has to go through the physical and get classified and maybe shipped overseas. And one of the things I've tried to do in my own work is not to dismiss either. That is, there is that world of public conversation about patriotism and belonging and integration and all of that. But then there's the lived reality of these American Jews who actually do wind up in uniform. And sounds like a trumpet call to, uh, <laughs> and, and sometimes their experience is exactly that. They do integrate with, they meet non-Jews of a sort they would never have met before. This is certainly true in World War II. And they do have these kinds of, this sense of becoming truly American as, resu as a result of the experience. But they also have, can have quite negative experiences as well. So just the caution not to substitute or assume that the kind of public discourse really represents the thoughts and feelings of these people who. Yeah, yeah, to sort of yeah, use all those sources, exactly, yeah. Another question over here. Thank you for your talk. I have a question about the Jews in the German army, army in World War I. Um, my understanding is that many uh, Jewish families did not leave Germany as soon as they otherwise might have because they had family members who fought in World War I and therefore felt that they were immune right. from discrimination. Was there anti-Semitism in the German army in World War I? Should I just say yes and move on? Or, uh, no, no, no. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, um. Yes, there was anti-Semitism in the German army. The question is, what does that mean? Does that mean that the experience of a German Jewish soldier would have been consistently, universally miserable? And this is where I get back to the last point, because I read a lot of letters and diaries. And you, know, you get all sorts of things. You get Jews who had horrible experiences. You get Jews who had wonderful experiences, and everything in between. So there's the controversy about the Jew census or the Jew count of 1916 that Sechlin, who you referred to, wrote, wrote, wrote a book about. Um, a few famous German Jews who went on to become Zionist activists wrote that the census completely destroyed German Jews faith in their country. Well, if you look at letters written by German Jews at the time who were just ordinary soldiers, they often didn't even mention it. They were so busy thinking about just their getting through the day, surviving. So after the fact, I think that the Jew census assumed a, a greater importance than it really had. Again, I'm not minimizing anti-Semitism. It did exist. The question is what, what, how we make sense of it and how they made sense of it. Did yeah. they simply accept this as something that we live with and we get through? Uh, and it's very much like a lot of the literature on World War I in general. What's his name? The guy who wrote this wonderful book on Bavaria about German Catholic peasants, Benjamin Simon. They go into the war. They have these horrible experiences. They go back. They're not necessarily scarred, challenged, destroyed by the war as much as popular memory and the art of Georg Gross or something would have led us to believe. 
And from a lot of what I read, there are Jews who went and they had these experiences. Many were killed. Many were wounded. Many were not. And then they go back. Yeah, you know, the resiliency of. And it's, it's no less true of um, the Russian army. You know, if um, one of the curious features of the life of Mendel Bayless, you know, and there's so many curious features in the life of Mendel Bayless, you know, who's, who just basically is plucked out of obscurity and charged with ritual murder in jail between 1911 and 1913, um, um, exonerated because of basically a hung jury. But um, he, um, he, he had spent two and a half, three years as a soldier in the Russian army and never had any complaints at all. <laughs> And he actually had a lot of Russian friends. He had Russian friends who came to testify at the trial. And, um, and so, um, you know, it's one of the um, wonderful things about doing history, what doesn't fit. And um, I mean, Russia, Mendel Bayless should not have had a good time with the Russian army. No Jew should have had a good time with the Russian army. I mean, he, so, and so, um, and so a lot of what you're talking about did happen. And then so much else happened, um, too. And, um, and, um, and the two really don't contradict one another. It is, there's a, there's a wonderful moment in Derek's book where he has a Klemperer, whose uh, diaries, of course, were, uh, were found and then published three volumes of them, um, his wartime diaries and his post-war diaries. And Klemperer is, um, is a, why don't you tell us, since you wrote the book. And, um, <laughs> yeah. um, it's during the Second World War and those Jews who've remained in Germany are living under ghastly conditions of imprisonment, forced labor, and he, so on. He's married to a non, non-Jew, and he, right. and he fought the so there's this, and he, yeah. But he's a First World War I veteran. And, and he converted. So, uh, he's a First World War I veteran, so he's been, but, but still, he and a lot of sort of you know, Mischling or Jews who have some sort of special privileges, they're in what are called Jew houses, mm-hmm. these collective homes, they're engaged in forced labor. And he says, what do they talk about or during the bombing raids, during nighttime bombing raids, what do they talk about to raise their spirits, their, their time as soldiers in the First World War? That's exactly what you were describing. Yeah, in other words, that this ended up cementing them. And they would sit there in utter misery and remember back to their time together as soldiers. Fondly, yeah. fondly, because they were armed and wearing uniforms and serving their country. And because they were, and this is something I read into the text, but I think it's pretty obvious, it's, a, it's an assertion of masculinity. Because this is a time where they are, they're remembering a time when they were able to behave as men. Oh. And now they've been emasculated. Oh. I, I didn't see that. So it's oh. there. So we, we, could ex- we could explore that together. <laughs> <laughs> we have time for one last question sure. back here. Well, the question is really two only because I'm going to speak as an advocate for this woman over here. She asked a question, which is a great question, which is, did people feel, Jews feel, that by, thank you, that, um, that, that by serving in World War I, um, doing the patriotic role, that they somehow gained some kind of protection against the anti-Semitism that occurred afterward. Now that I wanted answered on her behalf. On my behalf, I'd like to further this gentleman's question, which was during World War I, and I so want to hear you talk about World War I and the Jews. During that period where there were Jewish soldiers from nation states that had only recently become nation states, who didn't know if they were Polish, Russian, Lithuanian, or what they were, and then, they're put into the, they somehow are, are either serving or affected by the war. Let's say they're serving as Jews and they're facing other Jews who they still identified with as Jews of a diaspora. I am not the scholar of Judaism and World War I here, but I'd like those questions answered. So um, just, just to, you, you, uh, j- 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 you, you didn't feel we answered her question adequately. Is that what you're saying? Well, I think there's, there's a very specific question that okay. we can okay. answer. I mean, okay. it's a very specific okay. thing. I mean, to say the specific question is, Jews who had served in the German military in World War I were given honors as late as 1935 
I have found in the archives of the Israel military archive, where German Jews dutifully gave their decorations to the archive to preserve their, um, the memory of their patriotic service, decora uh, or, um, uh, or 1933, 1934, commendations signed by Hindenburg. This is after 1933, and even into early 1935. There was a hope on the part of many Jews whose family members had served in the war that they would indeed be spared um, the worst of the series of anti-Jewish legal measures taken between 1933 and 1938. And even during the war, the Terezin ghetto, Theresienstadt, was designated in part for Jews who had been World War I veterans. So there is this ongoing notion in the twisted Nazi bureaucratic mentality, and it's not consistent by any means, that Jews who had served in World War I might be allowed a certain bit of, of, of slack. And the Reichsbund Jüdische Frontsoldaten, the organization of Jewish front soldiers, that is the Combat Veterans Association, during the 1930s very much took this position that they had served their country loyally and therefore they should be excluded from or exempt from anti-Jewish measures. So I hope that answers the question yeah, specifically. Just, just to add, I, I was just reminded when you asked your question, and, and tell me whether this speaks to the question you're asking, but uh, about the way in which um, the, the interplay between fighting as a soldier, um, as, as, a, as a proud citizen of a state, and also at the same time fighting as a proud Jew, and the two often go hand in hand. And that's true in the First World War. That's true for those Jews who fight in the American military or the Russian military in the Second World War. The, um, I, I had a graduate student some years ago who was the son of a high-placed um, Russian um, Soviet, so, Soviet soldier. And he, um, uh, he came of age in the uh, late 60s, 70s. And I remember his telling me about how there was no talk in his home about anything Jewish. Um, but every single one of his family's friends and everyone they associated with had these distinctive names. And all of them were Jews. All of them were high-placed officers in the Soviet army. All of them had survived. And all of them socialized basically with one another. So this fellow ended up sending me articles in Russian, I remember, in the 70s, when I was still a graduate student. And the first articles he started to write about as a budding Russian Jewish scholar were articles about, about Jewish surnames. And because that was his only entree, literally his only entree into Jewish knowledge were the names of his father's family's fam fa uh, uh, friends. And, um, and, and, and then he grew into a scholar. So, um, and, and his, his father and their friends would have fought as proud Soviets and um, maybe rather more quietly as proud Jews. And, um, and, um, and the one didn't contradict the other. And uh, I'm sorry, I was, okay. Okay, I, I was. I, I was trying to be expansive and, 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 and useful, and I'm glad you appreciate that. Um, 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 yes, Let me just, yes. Well, um, one of the big differences between World War I and World War II is that in World War I, you did have Jews on different sides. Yes. There is a whole genre of poems, stories, rumors about Jews facing other Jews in battle. And one of the things I try to do in the book is I try to trace the origins of these stories. The earliest I can find is 1848. But they refer to the Napoleonic Wars, but I find no mention of them in the Napoleonic Wars. They reach a height in World War I, obviously because of the sheer number of people fighting, including the sheer number of Jews. A million and a half Jews are mobilized during the war. However, I was only able to document one case where it really happened, one. But the stories swirl, and this is documented above all by Ansky. By Ansky, right. So, thanks, Steve okay, thank and Derek, and thank everybody for thank coming. You. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Um.